just going through these things in no particular order, on May 2nd, I will be participating in a telephone call with myself and a man named Dr. Iyad al-Saraj from Gaza, who is a psychiatrist well known in the Israeli-Palestinian peace circles. And this is a new technology they're trying out. The phone call is going to have 500 listeners. And you can be among them. So this is next – a week from tomorrow, 9 o'clock our time. And at 9 a.m. our time, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be some horrible hour over there. And uh, I'm going to try and get the phone number for your people to call in. I'll try and have that on Thursday. And if not, I'll course web it out <coughs> to everybody. And I've just officially made course web into a verb. I have course web you. <laughs> 7 p.m. over there. 7 p.m. over there. It's not too bad. That's not too bad. Thanks, Nikki. It's good to have someone from the Middle East on hand for these occasions. So that's those two things. Tonight uh, here in Berkeley at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery on McKinley and Bancroft, there is a, a talk from so – now this is somewhat – no, not somewhat. This is actually relevant to the topic that we're, uh, we have embarked on now, which is a nonviolent culture, there's an element uh, in that topic which is storytelling. Uh, it's well known that people get their ethical guidelines from stories more than from anything else. There's a book called Why, Why Johnny Can't Tell Right from Wrong by a man named Bill McClintock, I think. And he, he proves that young people in particular, but not so young people also, really get their moral compass from narratives. That's why they had – they used mythology in the old days and today we use television. So storytelling and deliberately injecting a new ethical uh, position into the world has become one of the techniques used in nonviolent culture creation. And somebody who does this for a living, I suppose <laughs> – I suppose you can make a living at this – at 7.30 tonight in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, he's going to be there. Okay. Moving on from there uh, – yeah, Paolo. What is Madison Road Crossing? It's McKinley and Bancroft. So you want to go straight down Bancroft, but Berkeley High School gets in the way. You have to go around. Unless you want to climb over the chain link fence, which I have done a number of times. <laughs> um, so now Paul Chappell, who spoke to us last week, uh, who was in the Army, uh, he – as I suspected he would do, he watched the webcast of our discussion of him. <laughs> so – and he's probably watching now my comment on his webcast. And so on it goes. Uh, he has sent me two very long emails. He's keenly interested in getting involved in a longer dialogue with us. And I haven't really quite thought of how that would work. But he's an extremely interesting guy. He, he told me the only reason that he has not become a conscientious objector now is that it would not have any meaning because he's finished his tour of duty. So he would just be stopping. He would not be quitting. But he's, uh, he, had a, he had so much to say that I wasn't able to respond to. And I, and I, w I do think it would be a wonderful idea if we stay in touch with him somehow. If you can think of a way to do that, set up a special blog space or something, um, we, we should continue talking with him. Years and years ago, Kenneth Boulding said, if we don't reach out and figure out a way of contacting the military, we're losing our best asset in peace creation. I mentioned when he was here that desertions have tripled in the last five years. And he pointed out that more West Point graduates have left the military in the – are leaving the military now than at any time in the last 30 years. So there's a real dissatisfaction there, partly for the right reasons, partly not. And we should be talking to those people. Um, next, let's see. I spoke at Tomales High School last week. Um, they were a very, very nice uh, audience of young people. They got completely – if I could use an old 1960s expression – they got turned on. <laughs> and 
They now want to turn around and teach nonviolence in the local elementary school and maybe move out from there and teach it to the cows. <laughs> <laughs> so I rashly suggested to my friend who's a teacher there that some of you would be interested in meeting and talking with these young people. So I just – again, just want to say that that's – until we get over the open house, I can't really plan anything, but I can still throw out ideas. So think that over. Tamales, California, lovely place. Um, it's about, about an hour and a half drive from here, about ten minutes drive from there to the beach. I wanted to take some high schoolers out to the beach for a picnic. Try to avoid that um, elephant seal that's been going around killing people. But <laughs> uh, seriously, or at least more seriously, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to create sort of vertical dialogue. Um, they're keenly interested in football, so any of you have NFL backgrounds, uh, <laughs> be, be, be prepared to use that. Uh, good news is that Michael Lerner will be coming to talk to us next week when we shift even a step upward into uh, spiritual nonviolence. So maybe we start today. And finally, uh, two, two other things. You, uh, those of you who've been handing in your papers early, this is wonderful and we completely encourage this. Uh, but I'm a little bit tied up right now, so give me a couple of days to get around to Maria. I think you'd uh, get them back out to you. And the other thing is I hope you did have a chance to listen to the interview with uh, Jack Duvall. At, and I gave you the link last time. It was on Your Call Radio slash dot org slash archive plus a whole string of numbers. You have that down somewhere. And I can, I can course web it to you if you need. It was a very good interview and I'm happy to say that Jack Duval, who is the director of ICNC, Institute – International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. They did the film that we saw on uh, Utpor, Bringing Down a Dictator. Before that, they did the PBS series called, called The Force More Powerful. Uh, he will be coming out to speak to the teachers conference in July. So if you get a chance, do listen to that interview. I think it's like a good kind of barometer of where different people are at now with the development of nonviolence. Okay. I want to get off the stage as quickly as possible so we can hear from my friend Mickey who represents in the East Bay one of the most successful <coughs> in, from many different angles, one of the most successful nonviolent organizations in the world, nonviolent communication. And would you tell us a little bit when you get up here, Mickey, about how big it is and how many people you reach with this? Okay. But let me say a little bit more about an organization because we started to talk about that and we'll only be one lecture behind if we can say a little bit more about it here before Mickey comes on. Uh, I had said a few words, I think, about the consensus process that was developed by the early Quakers and how it was a much more – articulate process than just we're all going to sit around and talk about it till everybody's happy and those who aren't are willing to keep their mouth shut. It's much more articulate than that. It does provide a systematic way for the community to make decisions and move forward without dividing itself into winners and losers. Sometimes even people who get up and say, I am a uniter, not a divider, turn out to be dividers. And you knew that all <coughs> along if you had more than a, about a 54 IQ that you were actually willing to use. But uh, anyway, pardon my bitterness, but the standard political process is very divisive. It keeps on breaking down community. We call it democracy, but it's an alienating and segregating process. And there are worse things about democracy that Gandhi had to say that we pointed out last semester in the readings from Hind Swaraj. So if it's a particular interest of yours, get a hold of that little booklet <coughs> called Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule and in it he critiques democracy as a, a system, not as an ideal. As an ideal, we're all totally on board with it. But as an implementation, especially by the British parliamentary system, he had some critiques. And he had to have because they were using democracy as a club to beat India down with. We have democracy, you don't. If you're thinking to yourself, hmm, that sounds familiar, 
We're going to come in and carpet bomb you into democracy. That's still going on. So it's good to know that democracy as a political structure has certain shortcomings with regard to the implementation of loving community. And I talked about one of them when Paul was here, here right? That uh, uh, has Kant and other people have pointed out that when democracies go to war, it's worse because it's like the whole community is taking responsibility, which means nobody is. Okay. Um, so that, that much we had said so far, hearing about the Quakers. And I wanted to mention a new idea that's come into this whole concept, and that is the idea of looking even deeper into nature than the Quaker community and looking at the way what they call living systems self-organize and ask if there isn't an analogy which human systems can build upon to organize in a natural way that would enable us to maintain living community and still make decisions and so forth. And in the, in the 70s, there was this attempt to reorganize the world. Uh, it, it mostly it was being done in New York, which needed some reorganization at that point. And uh, <coughs> it was okay, but it was, on, it was all on paper. And uh, there was a project, for example, called the World Order Modeling Project. It has a very nice acronym, WAMP. <laughs> and they were – they would have tons of blackboards. They didn't have computers in those days, so there'd be all these blackboards and white, uh, you know, newspaper, <coughs> newsprint paper. And they kept reorganizing the world. And no matter how they did it, there were two things wrong with it. It just kept on being hierarchical, for one thing. And second of all, it just stayed there on those pieces of paper <laughs> in New York. It had no relationship to reality. Well, people are still trying that. And here's, here's a very pretty picture. I don't know if you can zoom in on this. I, th I, think, uh, I think peace should be pretty. <laughs> uh, and this is a, a, an organizational diagram of the world, only not a standard hierarchical diagram where you have the $300 million a year CEO at the top and <laughs> all these little boxes going down and down. Uh, but just, you know, in terms of real interactions, who's talking to whom and who's doing what. And then a step beyond this, I think, is what we've come up with now with this Gaia hypothesis that the whole world is a living entity and related to that the idea that living systems have a marvelous capacity to organize themselves. And somehow we ought to be learning from that if not imitating that. Well, in the uh, – World of nonviolent organization, the form that's been cooked up and used recently, as most of you know better than I, because you've probably actually been in one, and I just talk about this stuff, but it's this wonderful concept of the affinity group. And it turns out that if you rely upon that um, infallible source of wisdom known as Wikipedia, <laughs> you will discover that the term affinity group actually goes back to the late 19th century Spanish anarchists. They did not fare very well in the uh, Falangist takeover of Spain in uh, 1940, but uh, they, were, they were very passionate about anarchism. Anarchism, as you know, is something that we here in the nonviolent world feel sort of okay about. Uh, in other words, there really are two different kinds of anarchism. They all have in common that they don't want a central hierarchical authority. And as far as that goes, I feel that we're mostly on the same page with them. It was, I'm going to continue that sentence in just a minute, <laughs> but I'm interrupting myself. Yeah, on May 10th, 1886, <coughs> a court clerk made a mistake and he wrote down in the records – again, there were no recorders uh, of a mechanical kind in those days, so this was human error – he wrote down a ruling that, quote, corporations are persons within the intent of the 14th 
amendment to the Constitution, equal protection of the laws. Uh, so just one guy out to lunch, I don't know, had a fight with his wife that morning or something, wasn't thinking, made a mistake, and we've been condemned to this whole regime where corporations can come in and say, it's my right to exploit you and uh, you utilize your water for my profit and all of those things. Now, I, you know, this is a slight exaggeration. Clearly, if we weren't so out to lunch, we would not have seized on this ruling and made it into pr the practice of law. But it is interesting to note that there is really no, no 100 percent kosher legal basis for this concept that corporations are persons, which is the opposite of the organizational patterns that we're trying to develop now. So you had these uh, grupos de afinidad, <laughs> which I think is reasonable Spanish for affinity groups. And uh, they, they had a very great strategic advantage, which was that there was no uh, – two advantages, really, on the strategic level. They, uh, you could not arrest the leadership because the leadership was diffuse. And even with Gandhi, we saw that last semester. And the other great advantage was it was impossible to, for security services to uh, infiltrate them because the affinity groups were consisted of, consisted of people whom everybody knew, everybody knew and trusted. This is a serious question. I remember when I left New York, a week after I left, somebody who had infiltrated the hippie slash beatnik slash whatever we called ourselves movement in Greenwich Village. Uh, arranged for – it turned out to be a narc and arranged for a raid. And a, a week after I left town, most of my friends were behind bars. It was the grace of God that got me out of there before they sprung the trap. But depending on what you're doing and how much secrecy it depends on and, you know, how, how vicious the regime is that's, um, that you're creating, an opposition to, it can be very dangerous to have your identity betrayed. So affinity groups were very hard to penetrate. Even the FBI could not get in there. All kinds of funny stories, but I'm going to pass them over right now so that we can get finished. So affinity groups uh, are more or less spontaneously formed. They're democratic. They come out of what would be called in German Gemeinschaft and nicht Gesellschaft, that is the, the organic community of the people and not the s formally documented social structures. And uh, they're not centralized and they come into existence in contexts of action. And sometimes, which is very important, we've touched on this in so many different ways, they continue after the action. Partly because they like each other, if, if they do, <laughs> and partly because they know that we are in this for the long haul. And if you have to reinvent your organization every time there's an issue, or at least every time there's an attempt to respond to an issue, it'll be very inefficient. You have to start this all over again. Um, well, I guess – let's see. Uh, now, one more thing about what, uh, what affinity groups do, and I guess Seattle was the classic example of this. There was something like 50,000 people who had showed up for that action. It was very, very successful. It led to what we now call the Miami model, so we can't do that anymore in quite the same way. But what – affinity groups are not just free-floating clusters. Affinity groups have a, have a structure within themselves. They have different – responsibilities. There's one person who's called a spoke, and that is a pun. It's a, a spoke as in a spoke of the wheel and a spoke as in spokesperson. So this is the person who's going to talk to other affinity groups. It's, it's about as funny as I'm going to get this morning, so I hope you appreciated that. Uh, <laughs> if there's enough, they'll also have a media person. They'll have a facilitator. So they could have meetings that are efficient without brutalizing everybody. That's very important. 
Now, this is new that other organizations don't have this in a formal way. They have a vibe watcher. So when people start, they have these little machines, you know, and when people get too uptight, you know, say, oh, whoops, you're over 50,000, we've got to crank this back down. And they'll suggest that everybody stretch or uh, there was one meeting in uh, Seattle, a very big meeting, not an affinity <coughs> group meeting, where somebody got up and was ranting and raving. Probably he was the other kind of anarchist. I, I didn't quite finish that sentence, but there are anarchists who are okay with violence and there are anarchists who are not. And he probably was part of the okay group. He got up and he started um, ranting and raving and somebody just stood around and looked at the group and said, Om. <laughs> this is quite a large number of people all going Om together and just the sky was all chilled out and it was fine and they could continue the meeting. And then you, you read these very funny emails that were flying around saying, they all stood up and made this noise. I don't know where it came from, but for some reason the meeting calmed down. Okay, so there is a vibe watcher and there's also – now this is going to be a little bit tricky. There is a quick decision maker. Not to be confused with the person who prants and preens and says, I'm the decider <laughs> and you don't count. That's a different kind of person altogether. But if you're coming to a quick decision, are we going to lock ourselves down or are we not? You've got like 20 minutes to get out there in the street and nobody <coughs> there, – there isn't a consensus. You'll turn to this person who's reasonably trusted. He's taken the sense of a group and he'll make that decision, or he or she. So within the affinity group, this is a structure that's grown up and I don't know whether they found documents from the anarchist movement in Spain and copied this or whether it just grew up in practice because this is what you need. But that is what a typical affinity group looks like. And then the affinity groups will relate to – they will report to a cluster and the cluster will report to a spokes council which will be in charge of the entire campaign. So that's roughly how those things are working. The internal organization of the groups and the way that they feed their decisions up to other groups. So we will see whether this form can be perpetuated and adopted beyond the movements that they come up in and actually provide some sort of new basis for organizing society itself and possibly even the world. Okay, so at least we've said something about new organizations and we can come back to it later. But I'm very eager now to turn the floor over to my friend Mickey who's going to talk to us about nonviolent communication. Please welcome that. Okay, Mickey, can you get this? I got the little clip that was off here and some in the neighborhood of my pivot. Here we are. Just underneath that thing, I think it goes in here. Uh uh. This is going to be a bit of a challenge because I tend to be very interactive and uh, not lecturing at all. I don't like to lecture, so I don't know how we're going to work the, the web. But uh, I understand that the way to do it is that I will repeat what you say, which will be a great opportunity to model one of the skills uh -huh. uh, of, of, uh, of what I'm teaching. Um, so I want to start by inviting you to reflect for a moment on what nonviolence means to you. What is nonviolence for you? Where does it sit in your heart? What, what are the values or principles that lie at the heart of it that are meaningful to you? So let, let's take a moment to reflect and then uh, see if anybody wants to venture forward and say what it is for you. I depend on you. Anybody wants to respond? What makes an action or a movement or speech nonviolent? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's nonviolent if it embraces what is rather than pushing people away. That's more than what I Okay, so a metaphor of 
embracing what is instead of resisting and fighting it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mutual empathy. So nonviolence involves mutual empathy. Now I'm going to ask you sometimes provocative questions. What do you do when the person at the other end is not ready to respond empathically? <laughs> it's very, I've, I've said many times, it's extremely easy to be nonviolent when everybody does exactly what you want. The problem begins when people act in ways that you don't like, one of which can be that they're not empathic back to you. So do you have a response to that? I would, if, if, I, if I get too much triggered, I'll, I'll probably be with myself for a little bit until uh, I can come back and give that person empathy until they hopefully calm down and feel seen and Okay, so what, uh, uh, say your name? Matthias. Mat Matthias. Matthias? So what Matthias is proposing is a model. Now, have you started nonviolent communication before? You have. Okay, it was just too close. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, uh, what Matthias is proposing is a model in which I try to establish a relationship of mutual empathic care with another person. And then if they are not responsive, Instead of dumping on them, instead of making them the enemy, the bad guy, the person to get rid of, I look to myself or to others to seek support, to renew my fuel, so that I can come back to this person with an empathic presence that will allow us ultimately to make the connection. Yeah, I like that model. What else? What makes it nonviolent for you? Yes. Well, I like to, okay, what makes it nonviolent for me would be uh, state action without harming or without judging um, other people in a way that would be create, creating friendships or relationships that what I do when the person is not responsive it really depends on the situation, if it's something mild or if it's something very outrageous. I might try, I might still try to communicate with the person. If it's something I see that the person might not be aware of nonviolent communication or nonviolence, but if the person is really mad, upset, or wants to, wants a reason to be even more upset, I'll leave the person alone, I'll do my own thing, and maybe one day, or an hour later, whenever, I can come back to the person and try to talk about it. Okay. We went through this, and what do you feel? So what, what I'm hearing as the, the foundation for you is to do no harm. No matter <coughs> what, even if you really don't like what the other person is doing, to do no harm. And then try again at some other point to create connection. And I'm, I'm hearing in some ways from all of you something about the foundation being connection. Either connection to life, connection to another person, connection to your own values, connection to your hope, but some sense of connectedness instead of separation. Yeah. You want to say something? Um, I can't hear that. I think you said you tried it with nonviolence. I can't hear you? Oh. So I think that the important part of nonviolence to me is um, having a belief that in every person there's the possibility to connect to humanity, that there's a like, possibility to connect and identify with people and be empathetic. So, so I'm hearing in what you're saying kind of like an article of faith that somewhere in each human being, no matter what they have done, there is a core humanity. And that if we can, even if the person never shows it, if we can connect to it and reach for it inside ourselves, 
then our stance is a nonviolent stance. I'm reading a book now that um, I'm finding it really impressive. It's called A Human Being Died That Night. Um, don't, uh, any of you have heard of it? It's a um, um, South African woman who was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. You, you all have heard about that, the Truth and Reconciliation yeah, Committee? Yeah. yeah. Um, she's doing a series of interviews with one of the masterminds of apartheid um, um, murder, killing, I don't know, know other words, and she is describing in great detail her inner process of encountering this man who has done so much harm and how she is trying to piece together what it means to be that human being who has done all these things. And something that I found very moving is how she puts it together that no matter what he has done, there is something in him that is trying to work on making him still be part of the human fabric. And it is some, something along those lines. I'm still reading it, so I don't know um, who done it yet. But something along the lines of even when you have done terrible things, there is inside an attempt to recreate a sense of humanity and dignity of yourself. And it is that that we can connect with. Now the, the process of nonviolent communication that I am teaching translates this particular article of faith into a very simple assumption, which is that anything that any human being ever tries to do is an attempt to meet needs. It is radically simple, this proposition. It is not provable. Assumptions never are provable. No matter how much everybody tries to be convinced that their own assumptions are actually facts, assumptions are not provable. And yet I find it amazing how the world changes when I live from that assumption. Now, to say that somebody who has killed thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, you know, this is very different because the person that she's talking with in those interviews personally killed thousands of people, it, it appears, which is different from sending other people to kill, which is much more removed. He himself was involved in the killing of hundreds or thousands of people. What does it mean to say that this person has the same needs that I have? There's something about it that looks completely in, incomprehensible. How can <coughs> I resolve that puzzle? What do I mean? Do you have any ideas what I mean that, to say that this person is acting on the very same needs that I'm acting? And I believe that. And I, I, I would not go and kill anybody. So how can it be? What does that mean to you? Yeah. They both need security. Okay, so we both have a need for security. Mm -hmm. What other needs might we have? Yeah. Respect and dignity. Yeah, so we both have needs for respect and dignity. I want to push you a little further. In the moment of going out there and killing all these people, what might be the needs that are leading someone to do this? For me, if I can't relate to that, if I can't find it, then he is still other. And if he is other, then I am recreating a violent world. So what could be the needs that somebody might be acting on in the moment of going out there and killing people, dragging them, torturing them? What could be the needs? The basic human needs that this person is acting on. Anybody has any clue? Why did he do it? What was he hoping for? Yeah. 
Yeah. You just say somewhere along the lines of self-validation. Um, self-validation meaning, I'm not sure I know what you mean by that term. Mm -hmm. Connected probably to some fear that a threat to his own life or his, his So his maybe you're saying, I said, protecting his own life. Or protecting I mean his. It's, it's, tri it, yeah, it's tricky like that, you know, but um, these are, I think, very subtle things that then mount, with, you know, combined with fear to a stronger need and a proactive. So, so you, you are recognizing in him fear. Fear is more of a feeling than a need. I, for me, the belief that people do everything as an attempt to meet needs means in a very rigorous spiritual way for me that they're trying to create something in doing whatever it is. They're not just trying to destroy, even if they're destroying. They're destroying in the name of something they're trying to create. What might be the dream that is motivating him to do something that is so abhorrent to all of us and ultimately to him too, as is becoming slowly clear through reading the book? Still, there's something extraordinarily powerful in the name of which he's doing it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that could be it. That is moving it away from um, kind of like um, um, analyzing him as, oh, he's acting out of fear, which still keeps him separate to, yeah, he wants a, some kind of a peaceful, stable society which we all want. If we separate the dream from the actions, then it's easier to relate to people no matter how different their choices and strategies are. Yeah. I want to add a word to what Alex said. I, I think that these people are driven by a need for, uh, for order. They want to create order out of chaos. OK, so a desire to create order out of chaos. If I take out the out of chaos, just talk about a need for order, I have not met a single human being who doesn't have some version of a desire to have order to be able to make sense of what is around of you, around you. I, I'm very careful with words because words is um, my practice of nonviolence. <coughs> if I say driven by, it's a, it's a subtle way of making him other, still. Driven by, it's something like it's bigger than him, and then therefore he kind of like disappears in it. I'm, I'm not even sure that you meant it that way. It's, it's that the words carry so much meaning. In other words, here is how I test it. If I say to someone, if I check with someone, are you driven by? they will likely have a, a slightly defensive reaction. But if I ask them, are you looking towards? Do you want? There, there's not likely to be reactivity there. So if I'm wanting to establish an empathic connection with someone, I want to present my guesses as to what might be going on for them that is so hard for me to comprehend. I might want to present it in a way that they could recognize themselves in. Even if they were to disagree, they would still recognize themselves as human in how I try to under make sense of them. Any other needs that you could imagine this person having? So we talked about a peaceful, stable society. We talked about order. We talked about maybe some sense of self and recognition of self, something like that, which again, we all have. Did you have another one? Hey, um, I was just going to say I know a basic human need is to be social. Mm -hmm. and maybe in an apartheid society, he felt like hurting that group would make him belong more. Mm -hmm. 
So a sense of belonging with one's, with one's peers or one, one's reference group or something like this. Now, I, I am aligned with you. I believe that that is going on. Of course, we don't know. We can only make guesses until we actually check with him and he affirms it. But in the name of belonging, a lot of things have happened. And it is a powerful need that we all have. And for most of human history, the, the strongest avenue to belonging that we have been given is making ourselves different from some other group so that we can belong to this group. It is a very, very, very tricky path to find a way of belonging that is also completely inclusive. Yeah. This also, so to further that, to belong, now he then stepped up into a position to really secure himself by taking more of a leadership position, I think. But OK, so, so a sense of, of security uh, 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 in, in, his, in being accepted and belonging in the group. Yeah. Exactly, and then what usually happens if you enter into a mass killing or in a genocidal um, setting, once, they, once people have killed, they often get into a mindset of um, trying to make it better, and by killing again, there's the, the need for, uh, <coughs> for being good or not as bad is met for a short amount of time until the guilt comes in again, and so it perpetuates. It's something that often shows up in, 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 in mass killings, where people actually kill to feel better about themselves. I, I am I'm worried that that is a little bit analytic and again from the outside. I want to help me recover the full sense of the humanity of this person. How can a human being essentially similar to me be doing something that is so incomprehensible to me? I want to bridge that gap. And for me, that is one of the deepest tenets of nonviolence, is to bridge the gap inside of me, between me and someone whose actions are so foreign to me. Now, I, I started with a very extreme example. I, I'll get to you in a second. This also applies in the most personal of relationships, because often our biggest enemies are the people closest to us. Internally, how we make them. You know, you do one false move, and suddenly I scream and yell at you and you've become my worst enemy. Tomorrow I will love you again, but right now I treat you like you don't care about me, like I don't matter to you. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that you are imagining that his fundamental experience of living in the world is one of alienation, separation. And, and so then would you be saying that the killing is a, kind of like a twisted attempt to create a sense of connection inside of him? Imagine a life that's supposed to be more sorrowful than not understanding 
So, so what, what you're saying is that in, in your thinking and you're looking at acts of violence, you're inferring that it is a state of disconnectedness that makes it possible to do violence. And so I want to kind of like take a leap on what you're saying and say this much. I don't believe that people who have their fundamental needs met will resort to violence. Violence is always going to be a response to a state of unmet needs. Unmet needs. If I am happy and all my needs are met, there's no reason would, that would be for me to act violently towards anyone. So there's a, there's a I, I'll get to you in a second. To me, there is kind of like a striking radical implication to this, which is if you want to reduce violence in the world, work towards getting people's needs met. Because if people's needs are going to be met, they're not going to do violence. It's a very radical and simple vision. Yeah. So what, are, what, what do I see as basic human needs? Well, find out. What are some of the needs that you consider basic to being human? Do you have any? We've named some. Well, besides, you know, physical, I guess, um, respect and um, community and community. OK. So we've named, so far, we've named respect, dignity, community, connection, belonging, acceptance. Any others? What others? Yes. Autonomy. Autonomy. A very big, intense human need. It is one of the most striking things that if you are told what you should do, most humans that I've ever encountered, the first thing they want to do is not do it, regardless of whether you see value in it or not. The very fact that somebody else tells you you should do it, you instantly don't want to. Hmm? You recognize this? Oddly enough, to me, the biggest uh, manifestation of autonomy is to be able to make my own choices whether or not somebody tells me what to do. To me, it's one of the biggest spiritual challenges to stay connected to my sense of choicefulness when somebody else is putting demands on me. Because it's, it's very easy to confuse rebellion with choice. Rebellion is still, <coughs> I'm not talking about rebellion in the political sense. I, I want to leave that aside for a moment. I'm talking about just kind of, you know what I mean by rebellion. It's like, no, I won't. That feels very powerful, and it feels like choice. And it's still operating on the terms set by the other person. It's the flip side coin of submission, but it is not in and of itself choice. You wanted to add something? Yes. I, I, like, I like what you're saying very much. Some kind of a tension between community or uh, connection and autonomy. I, I don't see it as there, as there being an inherent conflict between them at all. It's that we've created for several thousand years a society that, that creates oppositions between needs. So that in order to be part of, you have to give up on yourself. And if you don't want to give up on yourself, you have to not be part of. And there's this tension back and forth. And it's extremely <coughs> challenging to find a way to be in full integrity. There goes another human need, integrity. To be in full integrity and maintain fully authentic connections. It takes a lot of skill that we don't usually get. 
So again, you know, like, okay, I will be honest, I will lose your friendship. So I have to choose between friendship and honesty. But there's a way of being honest that nurtures friendship. We just don't learn how to do it. Are you getting some of your answers about what are basic human needs? What other needs do people recognize? What other needs do you see that you have, that other humans have? Yeah. Um, love and affection. Love and affection. Yeah. Support. There is um, a, a, a big loss that especially our modern Western culture has about really not feeling what it means to be interdependent. There is such an idea that you're supposed to be self-sufficient and meet your needs on your own. And we've created a very massive structure to make it look like that's possible. And that massive structure is called capitalism. It makes it look like bread grows in supermarkets. And because it grows in supermarkets, it doesn't take other human beings for you to get your bread. It just takes money. So money, one of the functions that money serves in our modern culture is to mask our connectedness to other people. But the reality is that we are constantly in need of other people in order to get any of our needs met. Michael. I'm back a step, Mickey, because we were talking about the kind of honesty that does not alienate other people. That last semester when we talked about integrative power, <coughs> that's exactly what that is. It's in an extreme case where there's threat and the other person is assuming alienation. And through honesty, you reconnect with that person. Yes. It's possible, and, and I would say that the more vulnerable your honesty is, the more chances it has of reaching the heart of the other person. There is honesty that alienates. If I start telling you what I think about how bad and wrong and awful you are, it is not going to create connection. But if I tell you with great vulnerability what is going on in my heart in response to your actions, it has a much better chance of opening your heart back to me. And the tragedy is that when we are afraid, we protect our vulnerability. When we protect our vulnerability and mask our fear, we look aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you are wanting to create a movement from conflict to the belief that we can both get our needs met. And there's a, a whole process that, that, um, uh, of nonviolent communication, which I can't get into a lot of the details. We, <coughs> we get to have only one hour with each other. The, the key to that process is making a distinction between strategies and needs. And uh, strategies are all the actions that we take to meet our needs. All the people that we line up and all of that, but the needs underneath that is what is not in conflict. So when we work with two individuals or two groups or anything like that, our goal is to get people to see each other's needs as continuous with their own, not as opposed to their own. And when you get to a place where both parties can hold all the needs, not just their own, but I hold your needs and mine, you hold my needs and yours, and we both do it, there is an amazing creativity that gets unleashed about finding strategies that both of us can work with. A, a 
My favorite example of that is uh, a few colleagues of mine a few years ago went to um, Pakistan and uh, into one of the refugee camps where people from Afghanistan uh, were of various different uh, tribes and subgroups and did a three-day training there. The last day of the training was Friday, which in Muslim so the, the society is the sacred day. And as the, a, a few hours before the end of the training, the people uh, started getting really excited about this and very grateful for the training. And so some people said, why don't you come with us to the mosque? And then a few other people said, how can you say that? How disrespectful are you? They are Americans. They can't get into the mosque. And within seconds, they were at each other's throats after three days of training. And so my colleagues started really guiding them through dialogue, like live dialogue, to identify and connect with all the needs that were present for them. And it looks like there is no solution. They either go to the mosque or they don't go to the mosque. How can it work for everybody? And through very careful connection with all the needs and slowing the process down until everybody was on board holding all the needs, the strategy emerged. It was very carefully crafted. They were put in some particular piece in the mosque that wouldn't interfere with anything else. There was a, a curtain around them or whatever. I don't even know what all the details were, but they, they were together crafting the strategy. So the energy that goes into defending and protecting gets transformed into a well of possibility that we put together into creating something that we know together will work for both of us. You wanted to say something, is it still? Yeah. yeah. I saw Zine Kamisa uh, at a nonviolence conference last weekend. And what was really powerful was his connection that young people today don't have any uh, rite of passage and they don't have the connectedness. So this 14 year old boy, um, in order to get into a gang, had to shoot his son and would actually kill his son. And it really made me think that um, in the Native American tradition, you know, as the youth go out in the wilderness, that's like a interconnectedness and a coming of age ceremony. But there isn't that in our society. I think young people need that. So, so you you look you're trying to imagine what it is that goes on in our society that creates that disintegration of sense of community. And one of the possibilities that you're proposing is creating rituals or or, or ways of marking life that allow people to feel their interconnectedness. Uh, one of which is rites of passage. There are many ways that people can experience their interconnectedness. If that is a goal that people have, it's very easy to find ways. And the, the, the counterpart of interconnectedness is self-connection. We are also not brought up to be connected with ourselves. We're brought up, you know, in, here is just one example. You're, you're still fairly close to being raised, maybe you remember more than some older people do. Do you remember often being asked by your parents or teachers how you feel and what you need? Is that a common memory of yours? Yes? I'm, I'm just, you, you were, you, you were asked how you feel and what you need often? Lucky one. <laughs> Raise your hand if you were often, frequently, regularly asked what it is that you want, what matters to you in your school and at home. Boy, there's some lucky people. In most of the audiences that I speak to, there's hardly anyone. It's, <laughs> you know, this is interesting. Yeah. It is interesting because um, in, in a research that was done about who saved Jews in the Holocaust? One of the things that they found is that the people who saved Jews tended to come from non-punitive households. And it makes total sense because if you come from a non-punitive household, you're going to be less fearful. And if you're less fearful, you have more access to checking inside. What matters to me? What are my real values? Yeah, Matthias. I, I'm wondering, um, I mean, not my communication is pretty simple concept. However, it's very hard often to apply because 
we're not so clear what really what our emotions, you know, we, we use all this violent language basically that's around mm -hmm. us in TV and mm -hmm. just how we talk. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to give some examples of really how to communicate and how, you know, identify some feelings and just because we say I feel, it doesn't mean that we're actually talking mm -hmm. about a feeling if we say I feel like you're, you know. A jerk. A jerk, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's Take like, it off the webcam. <laughs> 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 you know, so. I'm not used to, yeah, we, we can bleep time. it out, yeah? I know we have a little time, but I'm wondering <laughs> if, if uh, you could actually give some examples of, yeah. of how we yeah. can facilitate some violence. Sure. Um, uh, why don't we, uh, somebody come up with an example of a conflict. Let's make it simple, not like some big uh, international conflict, but something small from your own life. Yeah. They want to be more involved. Yes. Okay. And you don't. Well, and for us, on our perspective, I'm just in school, I'm graduating, all this stuff is happening, so we're not really planning anything right now. But they still feel disconnected, so if we're having a breakdown and like trying to communicate to them, we're not doing anything to help them right now. But they still are feeling that. Okay. That's a very <laughs> simple one. So, um, the, the key here, my guess is that they are saying something like, we want to be more involved. Why aren't you involving us? And you say in response, because we're not doing anything. So what is not happening, unless there is something that I'm not hearing because you're telling me only a, a little bit, what I don't hear happening is hearing them. Just being able to hear them. So often, the first step of a, of a nonviolent dialogue is to hear the other person and what they want. So, um, would you be your in, uh, it's your fiance's parents, your future in-laws. Pick one of them and be, be that person for a moment. Yeah. Are you, is, is, that, is that really with your willingness or are you uncomfortable? Well, I haven't had a whole lot of direct, this is part of what I think is the problem, is that I'm not directly communicating with them, and so I feel free to communicate with them, so it's hard for me to be them, basically. To be? To be them. So it doesn't matter, because so it doesn't even I have to be accurate, it's just yeah. for modeling purposes. Okay. Just be, just okay. be, and, and so do it. I'm Ask me. Sister, okay? and I say, my um, so I will be so your I, fiance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, you know, you really need to include dad in the ceremony, and you need, maybe he needs to walk you down the aisle, and you need to really make sure that he's involved, and you need to make sure that all his needs are met. Okay. So the first thing that I might want to do in a moment like this is connect with myself inside. Because when somebody tells me you need to, you have to, remember what we said? My autonomy buttons are pushed to the max. <coughs> so first thing that I can do is give myself a little bit of empathy inside, silently. And it might look like, phew. This is really hard. I am just so longing to be trusted and to have the autonomy to make my own choices about what my wedding is going to look like. I so much want that. And somehow in recognizing that and naming it inside, there's a little bit more space because I've connected to myself. I'm not in reactive mode, connected to myself. And then I can come back and hear. Okay, so what does my sister want? She, what does she want? What matters to her? Apart from the strategy of dad does this or that or the other, what is it at the core? What basic human need of the ones that we've named is on the table for her? Attention. Hmm? I don't know if you named what we named before, but she wants attention. She wants to be heard. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to do that. 
What is it that she wants to be heard about? What are the needs that live there? Yeah. She wants connection. Any other, any other needs that you're picking up? Participation. Participation. Yeah, the, one we, the word we used before was belonging. Belonging, inclusion. So I'll pick <coughs> one. And in this moment, the one that, that kind of like speaks to me, and I always can only follow my own intuition until I've made the connection. So, sister, I, I kind of get it, and I just want to check with you. Is it that you really want to be included in this event? Yes. <laughs> so, I know that you're just playing a role, but tell me, how did it feel to hear this? Uh, very valid. Okay. I haven't agreed to anything. <laughs> One of the keys. <laughs> yeah. One of the keys to being able to be empathic is to separate understanding from agreement. We tend to mix the two. We tend to think that we understand someone if we agree with them, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's so. And if we disagree with someone, we will hold back understanding. <coughs> As if understanding, if I show understanding, it means that I agree. Because we live in the agree-disagree paradigm. The agree-disagree paradigm is a paradigm of separation. It's the same paradigm as right and wrong. Our yeah. word for that is coercion versus persuasion. That's where it links up with the Uh-huh. So instead, I want to focus on understanding. Now, that experience of being validated will now give her a little bit more space, just like I had space in me from empathizing with myself. Now she has a little bit more space. It may require a couple more rounds of, in, of, of reflecting until she you know, really settles enough to hear me. Now, if I speak to her, there's going to be more room for her to hear me. So, um, but I'm not confident yet that it has settled enough because I heard a lot of charge. So you said yes. So, so I'm, I, I'm guessing that you're really happy about this marriage and you want to have a sense of connection with it. D don't guess her response. Just give it as it's coming from you right now. So now what, what is happening is I am now hearing something that is sweet for me to hear. Instead of hearing somebody intruding and stepping on me, I am now connecting with her joy about my marriage. It's much more fun. <laughs> much, much, much more fun. Yeah, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is much easier to connect with one person's feelings and needs than with their ideas about other people's feelings and needs. Now, if it was, if you were insisting, no, it's not about me, you know, why are you making it be about me? I would say, so, so it, it's more that you just want the whole family to be included. But it's still you wanting. I'm just trying to connect with the energy of what it is that you want. Because when you get heard about what you want, you calm down. So then when I want to express, here's what I might like to express. I'm, I'm going to jump ahead because very soon I'm going to be kicked out of this room. So uh, sister, I, here's what I want to convey to you. First of all, I'm really touched to hear of your uh, joy and I'm <laughs> thank you <laughs> of your joy and and happiness for us and and I, I really experience a sense of support from that and then I want to convey to you my real confusion and dilemma I don't know what to do I am 
happy to, you know, think strategically about how to include you later when we start working right now. Um, you know, my, my fiancé is focused on her studies. We're not doing anything. And I want to know if you trust what I'm saying. Ah, so now I'm connecting with something completely different. It's not about inclusion. Now it's about something else. So you have a little bit of worry because you really want this event to go smoothly. Mm -hmm. And you yeah, and I don't want people to feel left out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so we continue. Th is that what you were hoping to see? <laughs> so as long as I am able to easily flow between expressing what is in my heart and checking in with her about what is in her heart, we will converge, converge towards connection. And it will take less time than you imagine if you can really stay unprotected and curious. If I'm protecting myself, less of me will be available to connect with you. Martin Buber defined dialogue as a conversation with an unknown outcome. And I love this definition. It's so simple. And it really points to the fact that most of the conversations that we have, somebody could guess what each person would say. And a large part of it is because when we start the conversation, we have an attachment to what the outcome has to be. So when you, I know that you have not been involved in these conversations, but maybe your fiancé, when he's talking with his sister or with his, anybody in his family, he starts that conversation with an already, it's a fait accompli that you're not going to be involved until I'm ready for you to be involved. That's a closed heart in a way. Sister starts the conversation from, I'm going to be involved now. That's a clash. If I persist in maintaining a position, it's going to be harder for me to connect with you. If I can really, truly let go of outcome and be available to the dialogue, to be affected by what you say, to be affected by what your feelings and needs are, then I might be changed. If I'm not willing to be changed by our dialogue, on what grounds am I asking you to be changed? And so often we go into a conversation, even with a lot of nonviolence training, even with a lot of dialogue skills, ultimately wanting the other person to change, wanting the other person to hear us. Why would they want to do that if it's one-sided? I want to come in equally willing for me to be changed, equally willing for me to come out of the dialogue, going along with your strategy instead of mine, because we've connected. Thank you. I want to I want to conclude with um, one of many stories about my nephew who has been raised using this system from day one. And, and then do what you asked me to do, which is to talk about the scope of the work. So a couple of years ago, when he was about six, my sister was going to go with him somewhere. And they had half an hour before uh, their time to go. And he started doing something. And then she remembered that there was an errand that she could run on the way and I know that most of you, maybe all of you, have not been parents, but parents, combining errands is, is like great, great boon. So she goes to him and she says, I know that you just started doing this thing, and I just remember this thing that we could do on the way, and I really would like to do it. Are you willing to complete what you're doing sooner so that we could leave earlier? Watch the difference between that and the normal parenting paradigm of, you know, I changed my mind. We're leaving now. And then he says, I, d I really have a preference for completing.
because I'm really engaged in it, and I don't, so I, d I would rather not go now. And it was not a big deal for her, so she said, okay, not a, no problem, so we'll leave at the original time. And she starts walking away, and then he calls after her, are you sure? I want it to work for you too. Now that is because he has trust that his needs matter. And when he has trust that his needs matter, there's more room in him to care about her needs. So that's one story. Are any of you parents? No. There have been parents in previous years sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing is um, I want to, um, and I want to pass these things out um, as we are finishing, but please uh, don't try to read them now because I, 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 you, ha you will have them later. It's an article that I wrote that was published in Tikkun, actually, a couple of years ago, and uh, just an introductory handout that contains kind of like in condensed form all the information about nonviolent communication. So the scope of the work, here locally, we have uh, trainings that happen just about every day of the week. There's something going on. The only place in the <coughs> Bay Area where there is more nonviolent communication classes than in our office is San Quentin. We have a project of bringing these skills to um, people in San Quentin, which is very, very exciting. Um, internationally, this process is now taught in, I think, 40, 50 countries. There are more than 200 trainers like me that are certified around the world. and untold number of people who are just teaching it without being certified. Um, and um, people, we do public workshops with trainers all over the world, public workshops, NGO training. A former student of mine it lives in Sri Lanka. She is originally from Sri Lanka and she travels around Sri Lanka and teaches it including to members of the Nonviolent Peace Force, including, she is Tamil, including she is teaching in mixed groups of Tamils and Sinhala, and it's very exciting to see what is possible even in the midst of great rifts. And many other places in the world, both public sector, private sector, public workshops, conflict resolution, uh, attempts at a different form of restorative justice and various other things like that. And uh, the last thing that I want to say before parting is if any of you are interested in internships and uh, have been uh, interested in what you heard today, then uh, come talk to me for a few minutes. Thank you very much. This was a total pleasure being with you.